Hello, everyone, and welcome to our eighth week in our course on drugs and behavior. Uh, this week will be a little bit different. Uh, so this week we'll actually cover two different topics in our two lectures. Uh, so far, we've taken a full week to cover each topic. Uh, these are, are smaller topics, uh, not in terms of their importance, uh, but just because, for example, these the drugs we'll talk about this week uh, are less prone to dependence and abuse. So that cuts out some material right there. Uh, so we'll talk about psychotherapeutic drugs uh, and caffeine. So two drugs that seem pretty different, and they are. Uh, and so today's lecture will be about psychotherapeutic drugs. Uh, so we'll go over the history of mental disorders, because psychotherapeutic drugs are uh, drugs that treat mental disorders. Uh, so we'll go over how these are treated, how they were treated historically, uh, and then which drugs seem to treat which disorders. And, and here we'll see that these disorders are complex, and, and it's not entirely obvious why drugs are effective in the way that they are. In fact, we're still trying to figure out what the cause of the disease is, uh, and in many cases we've discovered a drug that is effective in treating the disease uh, even before we fully understand the disease itself. But nevertheless, uh, we'll talk about why certain drugs are used to treat uh, certain mental disorders. And what are the consequences of those treatment, uh, of that treatment, both for the individual uh, and for society? Uh, by way of reminder, uh, this week is also the week you need to take your midterm exam. Uh, so by the time you see this, the midterm exam will be up. I will send an email about the midterm exam uh, when I post it. Uh, so you'll need, for example, the Respondus Lockdown Browser. Uh, I'll tell you a bit about how much time you'll have and what sort of questions are on there. Um, Keep in mind, do not start to take the exam until you're fully ready, because you can only take it once, and you can only begin it once. It's a timed exam, uh, and once you start it, that's how long you have to finish the exam. So you can't start it, take a break, and then restart it. Um, so just keep that in mind. And like I said, I will send an email out, uh, but when the exam is posted online, uh, so that it has some instructions and some information about it. Uh, so first, last week's discussion questions. Uh, we had a question about weighing uh, legal and illegal usage uh, of a drug. So the, the drug, uh, the example drug was GHB, uh, which is used illegally, uh, both recreationally and as a date rape drug. Uh, but it's also used legally in the treatment of narcolepsy. And, it, and it's sort of unique uh, because the prescription version is a Schedule three substance, but the non-prescription version is a Schedule one substance. So we see the same substance being listed on two different schedules. Uh, so most people thought that these should be separate considerations, the legal and illegal usage. Um, that is, that if a, certain, if a person has a disease, their access to the, to the medicine should not be limited by the frequency and the severity uh, of the illegal usage of the drug. Um, and, and most people actually thought that the current laws were, were appropriate uh, for this issue. And, of course, GHB is just one example. Uh, for example, if there are diseases or disorders that are, are less frequent, uh, or if the illegal use of a drug is more severe or more frequent, at what point does that become an issue again? Uh, so if there are only a handful of people in the country that can benefit from the drug, but it's highly addictive, for example, or highly harmful. Um, do we need to reconsider this? So uh, it's, it's an important question. Uh, the other question uh, was, I phrased it as, do we need a gatekeeper? Uh, and what we're talking about here is uh, whether behavioral therapy should always be a first step before drugs are prescribed. Uh, so uh, there were a variety of interesting ideas that were brought up. Uh, some of the most common were the idea that if, if you have behavioral therapy as a first requirement, uh, then you can hopefully avoid some of the side effects uh, of the drugs or eventual dependence uh, on a drug. And, and that's a valid point. Uh, so certainly if you're engaged in behavioral therapy, you won't have these side effects. Um, a question comes up, though, and then that is first, uh, what is the efficacy of the therapy relate, uh, respective to the efficacy of the drug? So if behavioral therapy has only a 25% chance uh, of alleviating the symptoms, and the drug has a 75% chance, does that change your opinion? Uh, 
What if it's 10% and 90%? Um, so again, we have, we have an issue that's not entirely black or white. Uh, there are cases in which it might be better to allow someone access to the drug, uh, whether or not they've had behavioral therapy. So it, there, there is no, as, as with any of the discussion questions, there is no obvious answer, uh, and there is no sort of one-size-fits-all solution. Um, and then that, uh, that refers to both the, the drugs and the diseases they treat, uh, and also the individual. So there may be disorders that aren't handled very well, aren't treated very well by therapy, uh, but are treated well by drugs, or vice versa, in which case trying behavioral therapy first makes a lot of sense. Um, and obviously there are treatments that are used as a last resort. Uh, but it's not always organized by disorder in terms of how effective behavioral therapy or drug therapy can be. Uh, some individuals respond very well to behavioral therapy. Uh, some individuals respond very well to drug therapy and not behavioral therapy. Um, so that, that was one of the sort of cautionary points was by putting this rule in place, although it may reduce the incidence of side effects and dependence, there may be, health, there may be individuals that, um, that just don't respond to behavioral therapy. And, and is it reasonable and or fair to put them through behavioral therapy? Um, and of course, behavioral therapy is costly, not that drugs aren't, uh, but both of these things are expensive propositions. Uh, so is, is, it, uh, is it justified to take away someone's freedom of choice uh, when it comes to choosing drugs uh, or behavioral therapy? And of course, that, that's a freedom of choice issue that will come up again during this lecture. Uh, another interesting point that somebody brought up was the effect on drug prices. Um, so, for example, if behavioral therapy is required first, um, what does that do to drug prices? If drugs are less in demand because everyone's going to behavioral therapy, or at least going there first, uh, what does that do for drug prices for those that have already gone through it uh, or are already on the medication? Um, so that, that, that's an interesting economic point, but it becomes an ethical issue for people that perhaps cannot afford uh, more expensive drugs. Uh, so all good points. Uh, as you uh, already should have received an email uh, about the new discussion groups coming up this week, so this will take effect immediately. Uh, so I've reorganized the groups, and now you have new discussion partners. Uh, so be sure to use your usual method of email, uh, or however you get a hold of your discussion partners, uh, but now you have a new group to work with. Um, so good luck with that, uh, and as always, good discussion this week, uh, and I look forward to next week. Okay, so this week we're talking about mental disorders, this lecture we're talking about mental disorders, and how they're treated, and how drugs come into play there. Uh, first, let's frame the discussion uh, by talking about the history of mental disorders. Uh, so one of the earliest theories on mental disorders uh, was the humoral theory, also known as humorism. Uh, you may have heard of the, the four humors of the body. And by humors, we, we're talking about jokes, we're talking about fluids. So the fluids were things like blood and bile uh, and phlegm. Um, so the ancient Greeks came up with this idea that a person's personality and their mood was dominated by the relative balance between these fluids in the body. And this seems laughable now, but it actually dominated medical thinking for over a thousand years, maybe even two thousand years. Uh, and it also still pervades our culture to a certain degree. If you've ever heard of someone being described as melancholy, or if someone is sanguine about a, pro about a certain prospect, or if someone is described in terms of their personality as being phlegmatic, those are all descriptions that derive from this very old theory of humors. Uh, melancholy, sanguine, phlegmatic all describe one of the humors being dominant. Um, in this case, it's, it's bile, blood, and, and phlegm in that order. Um, so it may seem silly and irrelevant now, but it, it still exists in our language. Uh, so that was a very early idea in terms of what causes uh, depression or r r rage or mania, uh, but that it was the bodily fluids that did it. Uh, after a while, this, this gave way or at least shared the stage with more natural explanations. Uh, so if you've ever heard the term lunatic, uh, that's the same word root as lunar, as in referring to the moon. So it was thought that the moon 
could affect people's personalities, uh, could affect the incidence of, of madness, that people were more likely to go mad or insane when the moon was full. Um, and you still see holdovers from this in terms like lunatic uh, in ideas about werewolves being uh, transformed by the full moon. Um, and it's still a, an idea in astrology, of course, that the moon can influence people's lives and their behavior. Uh, after that, there came more supernatural explanations. And these are things like being possessed by demons or spirits, uh, or being possessed by or influenced by gods. Uh, and so these were supernatural explanations for mental illness. Um, as we'll see, there are a variety of forms of mental illness, uh, but schizophrenia is one of the most common, uh, and it's one of the most disturbing in terms of mental state. Uh, also, there are things like epilepsy. Uh, epilepsy was thought to depend on the moon, uh, but also was thought to be the result of possession by spirits, for example, in certain cultures. Uh, also, things like visions. So having spiritual visions or hallucinations, as we would call them now, um, obviously influenced people's religious beliefs, but they also influenced in, uh, people and, and their place in society. Um, so now people that have visual hallucinations uh, often have things like epilepsy. They have auditory hallucinations. It's often something like schizophrenia. Um, but, of course, earlier in, in earlier times, there were no explanations for these experiences, and so they resorted to supernatural explanations. Uh, and so when it comes to treatment of the mentally ill, of course, for things like possession by spirits, we have religious ceremonies like exorcisms, for example. Um, historically, moving a little bit further in time to the 1600s, 1700s, a little bit earlier, uh, the mentally ill were expected to be taken care of by their families at home. Uh, eventually, uh, in Europe especially, uh, you have the idea of institutionalization. Uh, so this is where someone would be put in a mental institution, uh, more or less as, as, a, as a prisoner, uh, although um, not with a, a sentence or you know, no, no criminal overtones. It was just, this is a place where you put the mentally ill because they were dangerous themselves, their families, or their or society at large. Um, if you've ever heard the term bedlam, meaning chaos, uh, that term takes its name from a mental institution in Britain. It was Bethlehem and then Bethlehem uh, Mental Hospital. And as you might imagine, the methods of treatment weren't, weren't very sophisticated, even though you had mental institutions. It was mainly just a big room uh, where the mentally ill would congregate and mingle, and there was no treatment to speak of. And so it was noisy, it was chaotic, the conditions were not very good, uh, because these are people who can't take care of themselves. Uh, oftentimes they were, they were violent or delusional. Uh, and so as you might expect, it was a, a very uh, chaotic and not very well-maintained environment for people. And, and mental institutions progressed in certain ways uh, over the course of a couple centuries. Uh, but still, even, even in the 20th century, they weren't, they weren't perfect. Um, for example, you have the development of lobotomies. And this is applied commonly to people with schizophrenia or people who were suspected of having schizophrenia, uh, because it relieved some of their symptoms. Uh, this was a, a method by which a metal probe was inserted uh, and used to basically slice off the frontal lobe of the brain. It wasn't very precise, um, and their symptoms did get better. But they were also, in many cases, very unresponsive. So it got rid of the, the symptoms, the, the behaviors that people wanted to eliminate, but it also sort of took away the, the person themselves. Um, they could function at a very basic level most of the time, but again, you've sort of taken away what made the, the person an individual. So lobotomies, of course, now are not performed anymore, but it wasn't all that long ago that they were. In fact, they were hailed as sort of a miracle cure. Um, but it turns out they, they were sort of an unnecessarily harsh treatment. Uh, so that brings us to about the middle of the 20th century. Uh, and then around this time, uh, psychology as a field started to try to classify mental disorders a little more carefully. 
and you have, for example, the what's called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, of Mental Disorders. Uh, and right now it's the DSM-5, so that is the current volume. That's pretty recent, but obviously there have been DSM-1 through 4. Um, so our, our ideas of what constitutes a mental disorder, what the symptoms are, how it's treated, these things continue to evolve. Uh, and what we'll be talking about today are just a handful of these mental disorders, uh, the ones for which psychotherapeutic drugs are most applied. Uh, we have anxiety disorders, uh, things like panic disorder, which is an increased incidence of panic attacks. Uh, you also have things like agoraphobia, the, the fear of uh, open spaces and the outdoors. Uh, as I mentioned last week, uh, specific phobias tend not to be that well treated by drugs. Uh, agoraphobia is a little more amenable to treatment, but uh, that is just one kind of anxiety disorder. You also have things like mood disorders. So, for example, bipolar disorder, which historically has been called manic depression. It's called bipolar because it, the person exists on sort of two uh, opposite ends of a spectrum. So they are, sometimes they are manic, that is very high energy. Um, they, they seek pleasure, they feel pleasure easily, they become hypersexual, um, they become uh, very uh, uh, alert, they're, they're awake for days at a time. Uh, and you have the opposite end. The, the depression portion, where they, they sleep a lot, um, they have difficulty feeling pleasure, uh, they have diminished emotional responses. Of course, these are just some of the symptoms, but that's what bipolar disorder is. It's the, it's the coexistence, not simultaneously, but in the same individual, uh, of these two extremes. And you also have depression, also, also known as major depression. Or again, you just have the depressive end of that bipolar disorder. Uh, and these turn out to be treated with varying effectiveness um, by different drugs. And so they, they have some commonalities, uh, but the, the presence of the manic episodes uh, is really what distinguishes bipolar disorder. Uh, but they're treated with drugs that are, not surprisingly, uh, designed to help regulate mood. So the person doesn't have those depressive episodes, but they also don't have those manic ones. Uh, you also have schizophrenia, which is a very common mental disorder. It's very devastating. Uh, by the way, schizophrenia is not the possession of multiple personalities. That, that mistake gets made a lot. Um, but being schizophrenic doesn't mean you have multiple personalities simultaneously. Uh, schizophrenia is, is best described, as, as your book puts it, as sort of a shattered mind. You have a, a diminished access to reality. Uh, you have but what we call positive and negative symptoms. We'll talk about that uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, but schizophrenia is a very important mental disorder, uh, and it is in many cases amenable to treatment, uh, primarily uh, drug treatment. So moving on to drug treatment, uh, as I mentioned, you have the anxiety disorders, and these are mainly treated with anxiolytics, and we talked about that last week. Uh, so these are depressant drugs, that decrease the excitability of the nervous system uh, and thereby alleviate anxiety. So I'm not going to spend much time on those because we've already sort of talked about them. Uh, you also have the drugs for mood disorders. Uh, and one of the earliest kinds developed was uh, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, otherwise known as the MAOIs. And you'll hear that term come up on television commercials for other drugs saying you shouldn't take this if you're also on an MAOI. Um, so what monoamine oxidase inhibitors do is they, this is going to sound glib, uh, but they inhibit monoamine oxidase, which is an enzyme. What does that enzyme do? Uh, well, it, it breaks down the monoamine neurotransmitters. And that's not a word we've brought up before, but monoamine is a chemical designation. So dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine uh, are all monoamine neurotransmitters. So an MAOI inhibits the breakdown of all three neurotransmitters. And over here on the left, we have a table of the various classes of drugs that are used to treat mood disorders. Uh, so the MAO, uh, MAOIs were one of the first classes of mood disorder drugs. Uh, then you have the tricyclics. And this is, a, again, a chemical description, tricyclic because it had three rings on them. 
Um, and these were a little more selective. So MAOIs, increased levels of dopamine, serotonin, and or epinephrine. Uh, tricyclics cut dopamine out of that equation. So they increase norepinephrine and serotonin. Later on, you have the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, also called the SSRIs. And these are the most common antidepressants on the market today, of which Prozac is probably the most famous. Um, it was developed in the mid-80s, so this is about when the SSRIs started to come on the market, and they really sort of revolutionized uh, the treatment of mood disorders because, as the name suggests, they're selective for serotonin. So you've gone from the MAOIs, which affect dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin, to the tricyclics, which just affect serotonin and norepinephrine, to the SSRIs, which just affect serotonin, more or less. Um, there is some spillover where they affect other drugs, uh, other neurotransmitters as well. Um, but what we're really talking about is an increase in the level of specificity as time goes on. Because the more specific you can be, uh, the fewer unwanted side effects you hopefully have in the individual. Uh, these are, of course, not the only treatments for mental disorders uh, and for mood disorders in particular. You have things like lithium. Um, so lithium, uh, at first it wasn't clear exactly how lithium had its effects. It's just an ion. Um, it, it's the third element of the periodic table, so it's not big like some of these drug molecules. Uh, lithium as it turns out, has an effect on the postsynaptic neuron, which is not something we see a lot of. We've seen drugs of use like cocaine. They have their effects presynaptically. Uh, these uh, mood disorder drugs like MAOIs have their effects in the synapse. SSRIs have their effects in the presynaptic neuron. Uh, lithium actually works on the postsynaptic side, but regardless, uh, it does seem to have an effect on dopamine transmission. Uh, you also have non-drug treatments like electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, and this is just sort of what it sounds like. It's the passing of electrical current through the brain. Uh, and it's been shown to be it's sort of a treatment of last resort because it has some unpleasant effects and it's unpleasant to go through. Uh, but at the same time, it's been shown to be very effective, especially for depression. Um, there are some side effects like memory loss, uh, but it does seem to be effective and it's still used. Okay, so moving on to the class of drugs called antipsychotics. Uh, these also used to be known as neuroleptics. You'll still see that term sometimes, uh, but they are more commonly called the antipsychotics now. And as the name suggests, they're meant to counteract psychosis. What is psychosis? Well, it's a loss of access to reality. It's a break from reality. Uh, this is not to be confused with psychopathy. If you are psychotic, that doesn't mean that you are a psychopath. And the names are unfortunately sort of similar, um, even though they mean very different things. A psychopath, uh, and you hear this name in reference to things like, to people like serial killers, is someone who has no empathy for other individuals, doesn't care what, how their actions affect other people. Uh, whereas psychotic just means, again, you have no access to reality. And the most common form of psychosis uh, is in schizophrenia. There are other ways to become psychotic. Uh, actually, some forms of drug use can, re can result in psychosis. We've already talked about stimulant-induced psychosis. Uh, that's just one kind. Uh, but schizophrenia is the most common sort of naturally occurring uh, form of psychosis. And, and antipsychotics are generally broken into two categories. Uh, they are the typical antipsychotics and the atypical, and atypical antipsychotics. Um, this is somewhat a historical distinction. The typicals came first, and then the atypicals came later. Um, there's also some evidence that the typicals affect dopamine. I will talk about that in a second. Whereas the atypicals tend to affect serotonin more. Uh, uh, there's also the idea that the typicals have some side effects, uh, like uncontrollable movement, where the atypicals don't have those side effects. As time has gone on, studies have shown that the atypicals have some side effects also, uh, and that these things affect multiple neurotransmitters, so that the distinction isn't perhaps as clear-cut as it originally seemed. Uh, anyway, in schizophrenia, we have two kinds of symptoms. We have positive symptoms, 
which are symptoms that are that are suddenly present that aren't in, in a schizophrenic individual that aren't present in a normal individual. So these are things like hallucinations, which is the perception that something is there when it's not. Uh, for schizophrenia, these are usually auditory hallucinations. They hear voices, and obviously that's not something that normal people do. So that's a positive symptom. It's not present in normal individuals. Uh, or delusions, which are fixed beliefs. Ideas, especially paranoid delusions, that someone's out to get them when they're not. Um, so these are symptoms that are present in schizophrenics, but not in normal individuals. Uh, the flip side of that coin is the, the negative symptoms. And these are things that are lost when schizophrenia develops. Uh, these are things like flat affect, which is the reduced level of emotional response that you see in schizophrenic patients. Uh, you also have anhedonia, which is a decreased ability to feel pleasure, just like in the depressed patient. Uh, so we have both these kinds of symptoms, and not every schizophrenic has all of these things, uh, but these, these are common symptoms in schizophrenia. Uh, and, and theories of schizophrenia sort of abound. There's no clear reason uh, in terms of the brain why schizophrenia occurs and why it has the symptoms that it has. Uh, dopamine very early on was indicated as a possible cause. Uh, so, for example, the drugs that seem to treat schizophrenia uh, reduce dopamine levels. And if you put someone, for example, who has Parkinson's disease on dopamine agonists, if you give them too much, if they're overprescribed, um, then they can develop things like hallucinations. They can develop symptoms like schizophrenia. Uh, you also have stimulant psychosis. Stimulants often uh, increase the release or the effectiveness of dopamine. Uh, so that's one hypothesis, but the fact that we have these atypical antipsychotics, uh, which have more effect on serotonin than dopamine, calls that into question. So it's not just as simple as dopamine levels, unfortunately. Uh, there's also a glutamate hypothesis of schizophrenia, uh, because drugs like PCP, which we haven't talked about yet, that'll be in a couple of weeks, um, there are drugs that can induce hallucinations and induce psychosis that have nothing to do with dopamine. They have to, they have to do with glutamate. Uh, and so we can get the, these symptoms of schizophrenia uh, based on two totally different groups of drugs, two totally different neurotransmitters. So again, it's, it's a very complex disorder. It's not clear what causes it. Um, and so it's not clear why certain drugs work and certain ones don't. Okay, so that's uh, the treatment of schizophrenia. Uh, now for mood disorders, but especially schizophrenia, what are the consequences of treatment? Um, well, first we've seen a decrease in institutionalization since the middle of the 20th century. So since these drugs started coming on the market, uh, schizophrenia is particularly resistant to behavioral therapy just because, again, it's a psychotic disorder. You don't have access to reality. And so it's very difficult to have a behavioral therapy session with someone who is perhaps hearing other voices or doesn't recognize you as a health professional. Um, but regardless, the development of, of drugs that can help with these mental disorders has led to a marked decrease in institutionalization. Uh, so since the 50s, uh, there's been a, a rapid decrease in how many people are in mental institutions uh, because these drugs are so effective. A person can lead a relatively normal life as long as they stay on their medicine. Uh, of course, there's a very high risk of relapse. Um, and, and this occurs for two main reasons. Uh, one, uh, these things often have unpleasant side effects. Uh, and so the person doesn't feel like themselves uh, or they can't they can't feel pleasure, um, or they have weight gain. Uh, there are a variety of unpleasant side effects that happen um, with these drugs. And so sometimes people will stop taking them because they're tired of the side effects. But of course, once they stop taking them, then the really disruptive symptoms like hallucinations and delusions come back. Uh, the other reason is the part that people will start a, a course of medication, and once they start to get better, they think that they're cured and they no longer need the medicine anymore. And of course, once they stop taking it, their symptoms come back. Uh, and then, of course, once they're in that psychotic state, they can't acknowledge the usefulness. They can't take care of themselves sufficiently to keep taking their medication. So oftentimes, they have to be rehospitalized. 
uh, because the risk of relapse is so high. Uh, and of course, because of the symptoms of schizophrenia, uh, paranoid delusions, um, a break, this break with reality, uh, these are also prevalent in prison and homeless populations. There are other mental disorders that are prevalent as well, uh, but schizophrenia is a big one. And in fact, it's thought that um, mental disorders in general, uh, there are more people that are imprisoned every month or every day um, in state or federal prisons due to, mental, due to mental disorders that are actually put in psychiatric hospitals. And of course, the homeless population has a large percentage uh, of its composition uh, that, that, that uh, that, that are individuals with mental disorders because, again, they can't take care of themselves. Um, they can't maintain occupations. They can't maintain a household. And so oftentimes they'll end up on the street. Uh, and so th these, are, these are big problems. Um, but it brings up an important issue. Um, and this is part of our discussion this week. Uh, is How do we weigh individual freedoms, that is the choice to take a medication or not, uh, against the benefits to the person and society. Not an there's no obvious answer, um, so we have to, to think about that carefully. Uh, but again, this is a big issue in our society because when mental disorders go untreated or someone stops treating themselves, uh, then we have this recurrence of symptoms. Okay, so that is it for our topic on mental disorders and on psychotherapeutic drugs. Uh, next time we will look at caffeine, very different drug. Uh, so we'll start with its history, as always. Uh, and then we'll talk about mechanism of action. How does caffeine work in the brain? And what effect does it have on behavior? Uh, and then what are the consequences of use, both short-term uh, and long-term? Uh, and so we'll talk about that next time, and I will see you then.